are the um are the trends you've been speaking about in U.S. universities? Do you think they're responsible for a lot of what's coming out of the academic left, mainly postmodernism? Do you think um, that has a particular place in the doctrinal system, mainly people wanting to be subversive but not rock the boat, or do you think there's some other explanation for that? Well, you know, individuals have their own reasons, and you have to look and ask why they're doing things. But if you look at the phenomena as a whole its effect has been, I think the effect is pretty clear. Uh, it allows people to take a very radical stance, you know, more radical than thou, but to be completely dissociated from anything that's happening for many reasons. One reason is nobody can understand a word they're saying. You know, <laughs> so they're already dissociated. It's kind of like a private lingo. And it's very, uh, rewo you know, there's a lot of uh, material reward that comes from it. Like if you're part of that system, you can run around the conferences and get big professorships and, you know, all this kind of stuff. Uh, so there's a lot of sort of conventional material reward, and it has this very radical look to it, so you feel, you know, every... Well, let me just give you an example. I, I gave a talk two, a couple of days, last Saturday, last Saturday, uh, at Birzeit University, you know, the Palestinian University at the West Bank. And it was, a, you know, you, like everywhere, big mass audience, political talk, mostly criticizing the Palestinian Authority, because I was in, you know, you always tell people what they don't want to hear. So I want to criticize Israel, I do it on the other side of the border. Uh, but uh, the, uh, and the, the audience, most of the audience, you know, very supportive, and they liked it, and they understood it. The guys with the jackets and ties were pretty angry, but that's normal. Uh, however, as I left with an Arab friend of mine, who organized it. He's a, actually an Arab, uh, he's an Israeli Arab who's a member of the Knesset the parliament, but an old kind of good guy. Uh, he sort of, la he was sitting in the back of the, and he, he, as we walked out, he kind of laughed and he told me that, you know, he said most of the especially younger people liked it a lot, but he heard one critical, really critical comment from a young woman faculty member uh, who, uh, sort of liked the general political thrust of it, but told him it was very naive. And, uh, he, and I said, you know, why was it naive? And he laughed. And he said, well, it's because you uh, said that people do things on moral grounds and you talked about truth, okay? And that's old-fashioned nonsense. You know, that's kind of this old enlightenment stuff. We know perfectly well that nobody does it. I mean, I talked about how apartheid was overthrown, you know, and how it was necessary to have splits inside the white society, which there were. If the white society had been unified, they would have smashed the ANC. But there were splits from the inside and basically on moral grounds. People didn't want to tolerate it, and that was quite important. Something, you know, talked about that. Well, that's naive, because nobody does anything on moral grounds. All power plays, you know, read Foucault and so on and so forth, if you can understand it. And truth is kind of like an old-fashioned concept. You know, there's no truth and so on and so forth. Uh, yeah, that stuff goes on all over. I mean, uh, the, the next day I gave a talk at an Israeli university. Um, and then it was critical of Israel and the United States and talk about the Palestinians. And there were commentators, and one of the commentators was the dean, and he, you know, he hated it, of course, and the uh, historian. And he said, he also said it was naive because I was talking as if there's, there's an objectivity in history. I was running through the history of what happened and saying how you should interpret what's going on now in those terms. It is complete naive. I mean, everybody knows there's no objectivity and there's no truth and it's this narrative and that narrative and so on and so forth. That's very convenient. It sounds very radical, you know, uh, and it's extremely convenient. You can beat people over the head with perfect... Uh, you know, self-confidence, because there's no reality anyway, uh, and it's just their narrative and your narrative. Uh, in the third world, it has, it's particularly grotesque in my opinion. It's bad enough here. I don't like it here or other rich countries. But when you get to third world countries, it's really grotesque, because the, uh, you know, there the separation of the radical intelligentsia from popular struggle is a much more, you know, it shows much more dramatically I mean, people are much poorer, and they're suffering much more, and these guys are usually pretty, pretty very rich, in fact, often, uh, and it's ugly. But I think it has served a function. I don't want to say that the people who are involved in it necessarily do it for this reason. In fact, I know extremely good people who are very active, and you know, I respect and like and so on, who are right in this stuff. I don't know why, but uh, that means something to them. But uh, as a general phenomenon, I think that's the way it's worked. It's worked as a way of insulating 
sectors of a kind of radical intelligentsia from popular movements and actual activism, uh, and uh, serving as and it served as an instrument of power. I think I suspect that's the reason why it's so readily tolerated in the universities. I mean, it's all over the place, in the third world as well, you know, because of the function it serves. 